Kathy Bartos and I was a Peace Corps volunteer in 1993 and 94 in Ecuador, South America in rural public health nursing. And I came back and talked, spoke with the director of Peace Corps in Ecuador at the time and I told him that I had so much work there's no way I could do it all and that they were expecting a lot of primary care which is really not the goal of Peace Corps, the goal is to work ourselves out of a job, to do development work. Uh, but I was telling him this community definitely had the expectation that I was going to be doing primary health care mm -hmm. and to be developing classes and health classes and, and there are 26 communities expecting health education that I felt a bit overwhelmed with my site. So he thought, initially he thought, well, maybe my Spanish just wasn't good and I didn't understand. So he decided he would go on it. He wanted to send us on a weekend. The, the girl that was uh, wanting a different site than what she explored, uh, he wanted to come with us to see just really what was going on out there. So, and he happened to be a physician. He was the director of Peace Corps Ecuador at the time, but he'd been a physician. And so he came, he traveled with us. And uh, indeed, again, as soon as on the bus ride, we start here at the second bus ride, we start hearing about all the needs of the community. And again, when we arrive on the shore, there's all number of patients lined up waiting for primary care. Again, we didn't have any supplies. We had very limited supplies. And, um, and he heard about the 26 communities and all the needs. Fortunately, they, um, there was uh, a man holding a child, about a six-year-old uh, little girl who was in unconscious. She'd had severe diarrhea and vomiting and uh, was so dehydrated she was unconscious at the time. Again, it's nightfall. So we take her into the home and uh, we, ha we don't have any IV supplies or anything. So we start thinking and uh, trying to be resourceful and we noticed that there was a hose in the canoe using to siphon gas. So we washed that and then we mixed we had boiled water, clean water with sugar and salt and made oral rehydration fluid. And so we used a tube and we put it um, in her nose down to her stomach and orally rehydrated her um, little by little. And after sometime in the middle of the night, she started to come around a little bit and started uh, vomiting, but she also started to urinate. So we knew we were making progress and she was very drowsy, but more arousable by morning and uh, the, how old was she? she's six about six yeah and um, of course we communicated how grave and how severe this dehydration was to the family and um, they did call the medicine man to come and perform a ceremony and he did and uh, you know we're we have no electricity at this site we're using candles or our, our flashlights and uh, this medicine man is dancing around and chanting and singing in Quechua and um, he kind of did some massage to her and he smoked a cigarette, he lit a cigarette and blew smoke in her hair and he's doing the ceremony and we're trying to inject a little bit of oral rehydration in this tube that we found and um, it was amazing. So. The director was then convinced that there was a lot of work, so he saw a number of skin conditions, he saw you know, patients with fever, and so he was convinced, and so he agreed to let two volunteers be in the same site in this case. I mean, it wasn't always easy. I mean, it's a rainforest. You would have to get used to getting poured on every single day. I mean, we it rained. We said there was the wet and the dry season. The dry season, it rained once a day. And the wet season, it rained all day. So you had to have, like, no problem. You just got used to being wet and dirty and hot. And uh, you could just get used to it. Eventually, you're, you're used to it. Um, uh, interesting site being that remote and so in the Peace Corps office we posted other volunteers from our group would want to come visit us and you know and they had some time off and we posted in there you know it, it's okay to visit us there's no way to give us any warning that you're coming but please bring all the food with you because there is not a store out here and we are in for a full month and you can't eat all of our food well um, would that be an issue that some people just wouldn't get it and then expect well, you to feed them? Often, they, because they were so used to their sites 
where maybe there was a store a few blocks down or even you know a short walking distance that they didn't get it and it was unbelievable that some some understood and actually brought extras or brought us something you know, peanut butter was like a big treat to us because it was only available in the capital you couldn't they didn't even know what it was in our province in our province and so but some showed up and they just said really no there's got to be some place to walk to and we're like no there really there's really bananas and there's pineapples out there you could pick them but there's really nothing else to eat you can't even buy rice out here there's nothing else to eat you're not kidding and and unfortunately then they would use our supplies and eat our food and it was very frustrating so i would say there there definitely comes a point in peace corps when i was um I made friends at the Ministry of Health, both with doctors and nurses, and uh, probably every other month or so, they would do a, a, a health campaign. The Ministry of Health had a canoe also, and they would do brigadas. They would do these missions where they had lots of supplies and a doctor, dentist, nurses, and I would join them and go with them. And so I made friends with a lot of the Ministry of Health uh, healthcare workers and learned a tremendous amount from them. And. Uh, it came a point when I was way more excited to see my Ecuadorian friends coming to visit than my uh, than the other Peace Corps volunteers because often though they didn't have food and they were going to drain my supplies and, and I actually have somewhat of culture shock in our you know I'd say well we bathe in the river at night we don't have a shower we really don't have electricity and uh, they may not be have been used to that where their site was. Um, so visits would shorten them? Yeah, yeah, they would leave early. <laughs> and, and to get out, then the way you would get out uh, of our site would be you'd stand on the riverbank and you try to wave down a canoe or flash a flashlight at a canoe and they pull up and then they, you, they charge you a fare like a taxi and they take you out. But sometimes you're riding with a couple pigs or some chickens or it's pouring rain. <laughs> so getting out it can be kind of challenging. And then if it started raining, um, most of the people would take their clothes off and just be in their underwear and keep their clothes dry in the backpack. So that would also be kind of shocking for you know, people that weren't used to that, seeing that every day. <laughs> They're riding in a, in a canoe in the rain with a bunch of people in their underwear. <laughs> so, <yeah>. But <laughs> you want to keep your clothes dry, you know. I loved cooking and learning their recipes and how just how they cook. <laughs> it was uh, so fasc fascinating. Well, I mean, when you're cooking on an open fire, I mean, sometimes it's hard just to get to learn how to get the fire going was one thing. And um, the, the recipe, it's some of the foods we don't even have, um, how they even prepare it or cut it up. I mean, you're doing well, this like, by like can. Kind of they have. Um, Chonta de Palma, the, the Palma, it's a, a palm tree and the core of it uh, is delicious and you, you heat it up and you serve it with rice and it's delicious and it's nutritious and it, it kind of looks like scrambled eggs next to rice but has a different flavor. I mean it looks like scrambled eggs and um, so like to even know about that I would have never known if I hadn't been cooking with them and then it's really easily available so if we were out of food we could always go to nature and get some some of that and well I, I remember hanging out with one of the uh, Ecuadorian physicians and I, I, I said you know how do you, I was picking his brain well, well you know do people survive malaria of course they, they do but what about yellow fever and how do you recognize this and how do you recognize that and I said well what do you do if somebody codes like I was more thinking in my intensive care mentality, having just left the University of Michigan mentality um, from the ICU, now in the rainforest, and he goes, oh, codes are super easy. That's the easiest of all. You just say, no nombre del Padre del Hijo Espiritu Santo. <laughs> so, I mean, just... Stroke, I saw um, there was a child that died of burns, a gunpowder exploded, and you know, he had, he had the resources for a burn center. I mean, there's some other children. I treat a lot of burns, and um, just falling into a fire thing. Like there were it was everything falling into a fire, um, burns, uh, small burns from candles and things to falling into a big falling into a fire. He would come every day for daily dressing changes, and his father would uh, pay me in pineapples and papayas 
and, uh, or work if he said, you need anything done, I'll pay you back. And we just did yeah, the dress, burn dressing changes for weeks and he eventually healed really nice. Um, the kid that died, was it was a gunpowder explosion and it was huge and by the time he came to me, he was, it was very infected and I actually, it was becoming nightfall and I offered to, to start some treatment on the burns and do some cleanup and inject some antibiotics and stuff but I said, but absolutely we will need to you know, go out to the capital by canoe in the morning and the next thing I know, he was gone. His family took him back to the house, and I heard rather quickly he passed after that, which is so unfortunate because he, I mean, I think he definitely had a chance in Ecuador if he would have gone out and then, um, you know, here in the United States, clearly. But it was terrible facial burns. I mean, he would have, here in the United States, we would have done plastic surgeries and all sorts of grafts and that wouldn't have been available where he was from. Yeah, and then we, we had some snake bites. Um, most poisonous snake, snakes. Poisonous snakes. Um, most snake bites, uh, fortunately, did not, uh, they didn't have a reaction. Most of the times the, the venom must not have been injected even though, because they, they knew their snakes. <laughs> they knew which ones are poisonous and which ones aren't and which one bit them. And, uh, Fort and a lot of times they don't wear shoes. And when you, the, the problem is it's a catch-22. When you wear the boots, you have terrible fungal infections. And when you don't wear the boots, you know, a snake could bite you if you're walking in the grass. Or it was usually walking on the ground, foot bites, or then when they were cutting the, the tall grass with machetes, the, the hand bites is where I saw the snake bites. But um, most fortunately did not have a terrible reaction. The one gentleman that had a horrible reaction came to me in the middle of the, well, he came, around midnight, he was a community leader about three, four communities away, did not speak any Spanish, and was extremely excited, I mean, really wound up. Um, and by the time he came to me, it was a hemotoxic snake that had bit him. He was coughing up blood, he was throwing up blood. Um, it was leaking continuously out his, uh, where the, the snake bite was just bleeding all over. And um, so the first thing I did was I gave him like a Valium drug. <laughs> because I really need to calm them down. And then you do a skin test to see if you can use the venom. And I had said to, fortunately, that same uh, Ecuadorian doctor who had taught me so much, I'd ask him, well, without laboratory tests, how do you know how much of the anti-venom to give? And he goes, when the wound stops dripping, you've given enough. When the bleeding stops dripping continuously from the wound, you'll know that's probably enough because you don't want to give too, you want to give as little as possible but as much as you have to give and so I just remembered that and I started injecting and, and the problem is the anti-venom can also cause a severe reaction so I started you know giving injecting him with the anti-venom and uh, fortunately he didn't have a reaction and I want to say around six vials into it the wound stopped dripping continuously, or it was like a constant flow initially, and he stopped coughing up blood. He was pe he, he was urinating blood, he was coughing up blood, he was throwing up blood. And so um, all of that ceased, and he ended up being okay. I mean, I was also worried. The extremity was so swollen that uh, you worry about compartment syndrome and all that, but he ended up, the extremity was salvaged, and he ended up being okay mm -hmm. weeks to come later, yeah.